Right. Thank you for joining us, uh, Professor Tyndale. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, yeah, I'm a philosopher and a classicist, uh, works principally in argumentation theory. Um, and therefore, you know, I, what my work does is stress the inter interdisciplinary nature of the field. Um, my last work is focused on anthropology. So I've read a lot of anthropology. And what I'm moving into now is a project on law. So I'm starting to read a lot of law. So I think that, you know, that captures the sort of gamut of um, disciplines that are relevant within our field. And of course, there's many more beyond that. So even though I, my, my early degrees were in philosophy, I, you know, I left much of that behind, although it's, it still uh, haunts me to some degree. And you know, we have here in Windsor a PhD program in argumentation studies, which we've got off the ground, and that has uh, a real inter interdisciplinary flavor. So I've got some really interesting students, and they challenge me to read things across a range of disciplines as well. So how did you come to study argumentation? Well, that's, um, that's tricky because it's, it's more, I, I think a lot of my generation uh, I was uh, talking to one of them just today. We we sort of fell into it, right? We were, um, you know, we came to it in Canada from informal logic, principally, and its relationship to critical thinking. So we were working often as graduate students in these um, basic courses that none of the faculty wanted to teach, and at the same time, sort of. By coincidence, the, um, the, the academic field of the study of argumentation was, was starting to develop in concert with uh, an interest in informal logic. So we naturally blended into that. We started to go to conferences. Um, I went to the first Amsterdam conference in 1986, where Leo Gork and I had a paper together. He, he wasn't able to go that time. And uh, been going ever since. So we, it, it's a field that didn't have great respectability, you know, um, when we first started, particularly those of us working in philosophy departments, and gradually that respectability emerged as people began, our colleagues began to see that, yeah, this was, this was serious work and there was a research agenda there plus pedagogic features that were of, of value. Yeah, I, I want to hold on to one of the words you said there. You used the term informal logic, which I think is an important term. And maybe members watching these videos might not understand exactly what you mean there. Can you back up for a second and unpack that? Yeah, I should. I probably also should say that I'm one of the editors of the Journal of Informal Logic, and I'm at the University of Windsor, which many people think is a, a sort of nub. You know, for informal logicians, it's uh, uh, certainly developed in North America here, although others would see it working elsewhere as well. So um, there's a traditional way in which logic has been seen, um, um, particularly using formal systems to evaluate argument to some degree. And the informal logic movement, which has its, uh, I suppose it's roots in people like Stephen Toulmin's uses of argument from 1958, but even Perelman and Orbis Titica's The New Rhetoric, when Perelman was invited to call himself uh, an informal logician and chose the term rhetorician instead because he um, uh, saw informal logic being too pedagogical at that point. This was the early 1980s. But informal logic uh, took as its focus uh, ordinary language you know dealing with ordinary language there was a obviously a, a thrust on that coming out of various philosophical schools that looked at speech acts and things like that but taking arguments as they emerged um, in everyday usage which for for those to be translated into formal systems involved a lot of the loss of what was at stake in the argument so trying to capture all the nuances of, um, of the informality of everyday language is really what led to the, the term. And no one's ever been happy, I think, with the term informal logic as a contrast to formal, but uh, there it is. It kind of stuck. 
it's there. It's part of history and we live with it. Yeah. yeah. Well, so where did you do your doctoral work? I did that at the University of, Win of Waterloo. Sorry, I'll say Windsor. The, the University of Waterloo in Ontario. And um, who'd you work with? Well, no one that did this kind of work, right? Um, I was, I, I worked with a, my supervisor was a man called Richard Holmes, who'd published one book on Husserl. And I was working there on uh, phenomenology. And I wrote a PhD that looked at the relationships between um, speech acts, Austin and Searle, and the similar kind of ideas that are w w at work in the um, phenomenological field at that time. Because there was some connection. You know, if Austin hadn't died as young as he did, some kind of uh, connection would have emerged and I was interested in that. He, he was quite interested in uh, the work of someone like Mulu Ponte, for example, and that, um, and so I, I did, I done an MA on Mulu Ponte and, and that sort of f uh, fed it into the, the PhD. But the PhD had nothing really to do with, um, ostensibly with argumentation, although in retrospect, of course, speech acts has played an important role in the way I've looked at argumentation. And I, you know, I mean, John Austin in his book, How to Do Things with Words, talks about trying to investigate the, the total speech act and the total speech situation. And I try to transfer that to look at the total argument in the to total argumentative situation. I think there, there are strong parallels in terms of that, um, that enterprise. But it was John Searle inherited the mantle, as it were, from Austin and never took it in that direction. That was one of the things I argued in my PhD thesis, that if, uh, if that Searle's direction was more in, in, in line with what Miloponte was trying to do with uh, the phenomenology of language than what Searle did with a more analytical approach. Yeah. It's interesting. So you, you really, philosophy does sort of haunt the background of your practice, so to speak. Yeah, and, and you, see, you see these things more in retrospect than you yeah. do at, at the time or even as you're going along. You know, if I look at my body of work, I can see threads that connect it. And, uh, unfortunately, I'm coming to that period of my career where I do more of that, seeing the threads in the past than anticipating the, um, the tendrils moving out into the future. Yeah. Yeah, where you're starting to see it start to come together. I mean, at least you're starting to notice coherence in your corpus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So most of us, really, in terms of argumentation, we were self-taught. We, we, we didn't have uh, mentors working in the field. We were really the, one of the first generations that were taking this up and, and working with it. So now, you know, obviously we have the graduate program. We have students coming in working with us. We, we didn't do that. We sort of made it up to some degree as we went along, creating a history, and that, that history is still being created to some degree. People are looking, going, looking back and saying, well, the, you know, these are important moments in the history of argumentation, and we're going to pull them in. And, uh, you know, identifying, as I said before, the seminal texts like the texts of Toulmin or, or Perelman. That's awesome. Well, what, what do you think that argumentation offers society? Um, well, many things. I think two of them are um, key. Uh, we can use argumentation to understand how society changes, um, how, for example, the notion of reasonableness is modified over time. So what counts as reasonable at different points in, in the history of a society obviously changes as we um, start to change our attitudes towards um, child labor or um, the environment or the, you know, the, expanding the range of people who are allowed to vote. Um, you know, suddenly the, the resistance to those kinds of things in the past are seen as unreasonable. And it seems obvious that it's reasonable to give um, you know, people of uh, different genders or different races that with equal rights. Whereas that hasn't been, and, and it's been a product of um, quality argumentation that has brought about those changes. And so argumentation does, as a tool, um, change society, um, hopefully for the, for the better, although I, I think we could also find moments when it's been problematic, but principally for the better. I think also it provides the prospect of um, uh, personal improvement in one's reasoning, and hence the, the quality of one's own experience can change if we can um, gain the benefits of, of, of this. 
Excellent. So I, I know you sort of hinted at this before, but if you were to give your approach to argumentation a label, what would you call it? Well, I, you know, I think it's, I don't know if I hinted at it too much. Um, I am um, someone who works in the field of rhetorical argumentation. So I see myself as, um, as someone principally interested in rhetoric and trying to um, pull some of the features of the history of rhetoric into my approach to argumentation. This makes me a bit of an outlier in the informal logic community. Right? Most of the principal informal logicians that I work around or work recently around, like Douglas Walton, see, saw himself as a dialectician. Um, what does that mean? He, work, he sees dialogues to be, you know, arguments to types of dialogue and the dialectical approach, you know, debate, engaging in, in um, dyadic kinds of relationships to people exchanging questions and answers. He sees that to be the core of informal logic, whereas someone like um, J. Anthony Blair would see the logical aspect to be important. And I've argued for the rhetorical aspect. I've said that, you know, at, at root, arguments are um, uh, rhetorical in nature and the dialectical and the logical just add on to this. So a, a comprehensive approach to argumentation needs to appreciate all three, but one of them influences the other two more than, um, than the other two influence that. And that's, so as a rhetorical force, I think argumentation modifies intellectual environments in which people operate. And um, this reinforces values, it challenges beliefs, it adds new ideas to um, uh, to those environments so it's uh, you know it's a, a modify it does other things as well but in in principle I think that's the the thrust of what I, I see happening yeah and what what do you mean by rhetorical for those who might not understand well there's always an audience um, certainly I'm looking at strategies that are used to engage audiences uh, I think that's a principle in which we would think um, uh, the rhetorical comes into play. Um, looking at the obviously, uh, well, the non-logical features uh, that are often marginalized in an approach to um, evaluating and assessing argumentation. So are emotional components important? Yes, but not in every perspective, but the rhetorical takes seriously the emotional, the, the rhetorical takes seriously the, um, the character of people that are, that are involved in this. And, um, and therefore has, I think, a richer conception of, of argument, of, of logos at work there as well. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So what I'm hearing you say is it's going beyond just simply the words, yes. but all the, other con all the other considerations that might go with or come with the act of arguing. Right. Indeed. Yeah. So what is an argument? Right, well, well, it would follow from what we've just agreed that it's, uh, it's not a propositional entity in the way that has traditionally been understood. And even in some of the emerging traditions of informal logic, they will tr try to take all kinds of um, argumentative events and reduce them to propositions. Whereas I, I would see it uh, more as a, a dynamic act of reasoned communication. It's captured in the expression of reasons, but until they've been expressed, you don't have the argument. So an argument is more, um, you know, clearly it's, it's cognitive, it needs to be intentional, it needs to be developed in some way, but then it can be expressed in a range of different modes. Uh, that it has been traditionally treated um, in terms of propositions is the heritage we get from a formal logic approach, really. But um, as informal logic has widened its appreciation of the ways in which people argue, I think we've moved clearly beyond that. So we have a dynamic conception of argument as opposed to the more static um, concepts that the tradition has bequeathed us. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But you keep you use this term proposition. Is yeah. that something technical? Uh, well, it can be. Uh, the statements, reducing things to statements. Um, so, you know, different statements can express the same proposition. Um, you know, the cat sat on the mat. You know, 
the mat was sat upon by the cat. You know. So we've got a, an underlying proposition there, which is expressed in different kinds of utterances. So um, you know, those who take the propositional approach, of course, will look for the logical truth or falsity of the statement and, and try to reduce arguments to collections of propositions that, that can express this truth or falsity. And that's a, that's a problem when you move into the realm of, say, advocacy, where a conclusion might be that, you know, you should wear a mask right, in, when you're out in public. Right? You should. So what's, the truth, what's the truth or falsity of that claim? Well, now we're, we've, we, you know, we can't just stay with the propositions. We've got to look at other kinds of ideas um, in, in that sense. Yeah. So one of the things I'm hearing you say is that when you look at arguments only in the realm of proposition, it only allows you to talk about one type of disagreement, which is true or false, where we can have disagreements of value, where we can have disagreements of policy, which are different kinds of disagreements that we have in ordinary life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's um, you know, a lot of people talk about reducing arguments to, to the propositional base. Right? And that really is, you know, uh, that seemed to be a positive thing, but at the same time, you could say, well, it's, you know, what have you left behind in that reduction? What's, what's missing? And how important were those missing elements in terms of uh, fully appreciating what I said before was the total argumentative situation, right? the total argument in the total argumentative situation. Seems like you're missing a lot. Yeah. 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 So how do you identify when an argument has occurred? Well, um, we see a claim or a situation that has um, been uttered that demands some kind of response, what Lloyd Bitzer called an exigence. You know, I think there's um, an important uh, element of truth, correctness about what Bitzer recognized there. So a justification is given or demanded um, wherever we have you know, uh, controversy. Some talk about the marketplace of reasons, you know, the give and take of reasons within this. And uh, in that marketplace, burden of proofs are um, assumed or dispensed, you know, they shift back and forth. So wherever the, um, the burden of proof is, is clearly there, right? So somebody has some kind of obligation to support what they're saying, put, support what they're doing, to support the beliefs they put forward. We're, um, we're in the realm of argument and we expect to see an argument. Yeah. Okay. And how do you analyze an argument? Well, this, um, you know, analyzing and um, then evaluating. So yeah. some of my colleagues would, would make a distinction there. We, how do you analyze it? You, um, you try to um, organize the, um, the speech act or the argumentative event um, capturing as much of the case <clears throat> as possible and identifying um, the support, you know, the claim, what's, what is the claim, what is the ultimate claim, what is it that's triggered the notion that here we have an argument, how is that being supported, whether it's being supported by, um, by utterances, by verbal utterances, or by images, or by other kinds of um, modes of support. You know. And uh, what, you know, what strategies have been used? I think they, they come into play. So um, I, I, it's difficult for me to separate that kind of analysis from evaluation, um, you know, because even as you set it out, you've started to evaluate. It. And, and that's why I've resisted that distinction with some of my colleagues who say, okay, no, we do, we do the whole business of deciding what it is we're gonna evaluate first. Because if we start to get involved in the evaluation, we're gonna, mess things up and it's pedagogically difficult to uh, organize things that way but I just uh, yeah I haven't gone that route so um, I see argumentation that has to be approached by a sort of case-by-case -case basis I look for patterns of arguments what in the informal logic tradition are called argument schemes and these have um, they they give us patterns which are very uh, sort of a, a thin description of the argument <clears throat> and each of these schemes would then have critical questions which allow us to get into the contextual features of the case and um, 
and give rise to what I would then think of as borrowing from the anthropologist here as thick descriptions. So now we have, <coughs> you have the skeleton, the underlying thin description of uh, the argument that's been pulled out. You, and then you, as you start to do the evaluation, you're um, uh, adding the flesh, the thick description. So you're capturing as much of the total argumentative situation in that description. And the critical questions of the scheme, if they're well um, devised, facilitate that. Um, and then the, you know, the quality of the argument is really de determined um, by, um, I think, criteria for strong arguments. I'm very much influenced by uh, Kaim Perelman and Albert Stitica as you know, seminal figures in rhetorical argumentation. They talk about strong arguments having certain kinds of conditions, certain kinds of criteria. Uh, the adherence of audience to premises, for example, is an important idea. The pertinence of premises, which I take to be a, a relevance condition, and the resistance to refutation, um, both, I think, around page 460 or so of the New Rhetoric, and in, on page 140 of the, um, the Realm of Rhetoric, they, or Perelman, emphasizes how resistance to refutation is, is the criteria for him. You know, if, if it can resist counter objections, then we have a stronger argument. And I think essentially meeting the critical questions in a case by case assessment is a way to consider these three conditions or whether they've been met or not. Excellent. Can, you, can we return back to your argument scheme and critical questions? Could you provide an example of this? Well, um, yeah, a very simple one. I was just uh, writing about something um, recently, um, the figure of Jean Vanier, who um, was a famous figure throughout, throughout the world. He um, set up these institutions, the well, communities of the Ark, based on the notion of the Ark, where uh, people with severe um, disabilities, mental disabilities, live together with people who are um, not um, affected in this way. And they learn from each other, you know, and Vanier did a lot there. And so uh, he received um, major awards. And one of, one of the schemes we can look at is to say, well, look, um, there's an appeal to the kinds of values that this man personified. Uh, this is a way in which one of the schemes tracks back into the history of epidictic rhetoric. Um, so you would see that in, um, in uh, the funeral oration, where somebody is taken as an exemplar of values which are to be promoted within a community or promoted within a society. And we, uh, we appreciate that representativeness, so that the person is lifted out of their um, you know, real human nature and, and made an exemplar. And that's one of the ways in which we communicate values argumentatively in a society by identifying these kinds of people. So um, indeed, the scheme is very simple. You know, um, you, you would just you identify someone in a, in a premise as having certain kinds of qualities. Uh, you identify these qualities as good. And so what this person says, what this person represents are things to be, um, to be emulated in some way. But that's, uh, that's what I would call a thin description. And then you get into the case of Vanier and look at the particular um, qualities that he expressed. You know, how is good character, a very vague concept, how is good character um, understood in that particular case? You know, what are the qualities of character that are being brought out there? And that gives us a much thicker description and we are able to draw things out. And what's interesting about that case is that after Vanier died in 2019, a lot of flaws of his character came to light, which shows that arguments of this nature are what the informal logicians call defeasible. They can go back and we can revise our conclusions in light of subsequent evidence. And, um, and the case of, of Vanier illustrates that notion of defeasibility as well. It doesn't, the, the, um, detract from the values that were still important, but it does um, you know, weaken the, the sense of the man involved there. 
So that would be, that's a particular scheme that uh, one look at, the appeal to authority, which has a long tradition, as I say, goes back to epidictic rhetoric. And it has a series of questions attached to it in terms of you know, what, how is good character exemplified and things of that nature. It's an excellent example, thank you. So can you give us a more contemporary example of your whole sort of perspective on argumentation and how it might illuminate that. So your rhetorical perspective. Okay, well, here's a case I've been working with, uh, looking at recently, and it's a very Canadian case. So I have to give you some, uh, some background, but you should you know, you take some Canadian flavor away from this. Heck so yeah. Two, week, two weeks ago in the Canadian Parliament, uh, one of the leaders of one party, so there are, there are several parties, you know, there are principal parties, there's the opposition, yeah. the leading party, you've got the liberals, the opposition in the Conservatives and the Bloc Quebecois and the NDP and the Greens. <clears throat> the leader of the NDP, Jack Meet Singh, he was dismissed. He was thrown out of Parliament for calling another MP a racist. And uh, what he had done, what Singh had done, he'd introduced legislation that would require restrictions on police activities. He wanted investigation of the police. And so you're, see, you're seeing this in the United States right now. And this was how it was being manifested in Canada. And his motion required unanimous consent, and one MP opposed it. And, uh, and he did so, Singh claimed, by flipping his arm in a dismissive gesture. So Singh um, wrote, and I, I've got it here, I printed it out here somewhere, because I, I I've been working on it. Uh, Singh says, it was this brazen act of one member of parliament to not just say no, but to gesture like this, waving his hand like someone trying to brush off a fly. In that gesture, I saw exactly what has happened for so long. In that moment, I saw the face of racism. So this move, this was an argument, right? Singh saw in that gesture an argument that expressed no, right? But did no in a very emphatic way. It's very difficult to reduce the argument of that MP, the argument that, in re that Singh responded to and that got him thrown out because he then accused, you know, he broke, he broke uh, parliamentary protocol by calling somebody a racist. You can't do that in Canadian parliament. So he, he has to leave until he apologizes. Right? Um, but he got so emotionally um, angered by that gesture uh, that he uh, responded in the way he did. So, he, so, you know, the question then is, how do we evaluate an argument that has a gesture in the central role of support? Okay. Uh, it requires, I think, a recourse to the meanings that gestures have within a society, how um, people would understand them. So I think, as he describes it, it's a recognizable gesture. We appreciate that's a gesture of dismissal, of, um, of, of showing that something is not significant of minimalizing, uh, all kinds of ways in which we can start to build a thick description of that particular gesture. And I think other models of argument, other non-rhetorical model, models of argument would struggle to deal with that argumentative situation okay? uh, and would struggle to explain Singh's response because they would struggle to see the argument that he was responding to. You can't, you can't reduce that gesture to a proposition, although some of your listeners or watchers here might say, well, he just did it. He just, he just described it, and I, but I described it in a way that tried to point to the inadequacy of the description as well. So as I say, that's, uh, that's an example that I've um, used. I just, um, just had a midterm, a midterm exam and I put that on as a bonus question. I said, you know, how are you, you going to handle this? So, <laughs> That's I'll awesome. See, I love it. Yeah, I'll see you next week who, who deals with that. Yeah. Are you all still in class right now? Well, I'm te I, I made the decision to teach this summer. Um, I've never done it before, and I made it a while ago. And now it actually happens to be quite a good decision because um, I was going to be teaching online anyway. So. Yeah. yeah, it all worked out. Yeah, we're in the middle. We're in the middle of the term. Ah. Well, so uh, do you have any bits of parting advice to young uh, argumentation scholars? Well, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, 
first of all, you're welcome to uh, an incredible, rich field that has a, a, a vibrant research agenda that's still ongoing. There's so many fields you can join, and most of the questions have already been asked. You've got to find that that minimal angle of asking a question that's been asked many times, and you, you're going to try and ask it again and try to say something original. In, I, in the field of argumentation studies, it's not difficult to find research agendas that need to be taken up and explored. Um, just you know, how do we deal with gestures, right? Um, that's, there's not a lot of work done on something like that. And you know, again, it's the recognize that argumentation is multifaceted. I've talked, I, I say, you know, I principally see it as ways in which environments are modified. But of course, this involves inquiry, this involves persuasion, this involves negotiation, this involves advocacy. So it's a very multifaceted thing. And uh, we can learn about people through the ways in which they approach argumentation. So it's, it gives us um, a real entry into um, social understanding. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Tindall. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. Cheers. Thanks.